good grief. Question everything. Why? You're listening to Why, a Good Grief Network podcast with Amy Lewis Rowe and Laura Schmidt. Today we'd like to welcome Dr. Sarah Jaquette Ray. She is a professor of environmental studies at Humboldt State University, where she also leads the BA program in environmental studies. Her areas of interest include environmental humanities, which has a soft spot for me, uh, environmental justice, climate anxiety, emotions, and the college classroom, social movement theory, disability studies, and cultural studies. She did her PhD at the University of Oregon in environmental sciences, uh, studies, and policy. She has an MA in American studies and a BA in religious studies and women's studies. So we're really grateful to have Sarah here today with us. We will be discussing a field guide to climate anxiety, how to keep your cool on a warming planet. And then she also has another book that I think will be of interest to our listeners, which is called The Ecological Other Environmental Exclusion in American Cultures. Welcome, Sarah. We're glad to have you with us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. As I told you already before, you guys are my heroes too. I love what you guys are doing. And when Laura sent me an email to do this interview for the podcast, I thought, oh my gosh, it's a dream come true. So it's really an honor. Well, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're going to start with the basic question of in this time of great uncertainty, coronavirus, climate crisis, upheaval, how are you taking care of yourself? Well, that is a good question. And it's funny you should ask that because about a week ago, I actually wrote it in a document, things I'm doing to take care of myself because I, I'm a writer person. And if I don't write it, write it, write, 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 I will not remember it. It will not sink in. It will not internalize. I think this is one of those moments where, um, thank goodness I wrote the book. Thank goodness I started thinking around the time of thinking about the book that I needed to start to build some emotional intelligence and resilience practices for myself. I was having a lot of anxiety and burnout and depression along with my students. And it really hit a peak in 2016 with the U.S. presidential election, of course, but it has, you know, it's been sort of increasing for, I would say, it really started with my students about two or three years before that. So there was sort of a marked change in my students over the time I've been teaching environmental studies where they used to think of it as kind of a, you know, environmental studies are sort of problem solving and thinking very technocratically about things and maybe philosophically too, and maybe in terms of representation, but these were problems to solve either culturally or, or, you know, engineering wise or politically or whatever. And it didn't have the same kind of existential haunting resonance or depth that it started to have a few years later. And then I I couldn't catch up with that. I didn't really know what was going on. And I had not built resilience practices in my own life. And I have not, you know, in my own life had not really faced a lot of that stuff. And so I started to go to um, therapy for for a couple of years there. It was online therapy. She was just extraordinary. And she really helped me realize how critical my interior life was to my ability to do my job, be a parent, be a partner, much less a citizen in the world and all the other scaling out roles we have in our lives. And so I am really grateful that I started thinking about that right around then and started to write the book about some of that stuff. So the book is really my own um, report about my own introduction to it, even at such a late time in my life. I guess it's never too late. And so right away when the coronavirus stuff started happening, I could feel my anxiety and my, well, a lot, all kinds of things. And I remember there's been these sort of stages where then there was that moment when you realize my mom could die. And then there's that moment when you realize, I mean, it sort of kind of gets closer and closer and creeps in towards you, you know, and then all of a sudden I could die. That was like three nights ago. What if I die? Right. And, um, that I knew that I needed to do some serious work, um, right away because I could see the, the, on the horizon, what was happening. And I can't say, I'd say, you know, on a good day, I'm doing some of those practices. And I think a lot of them slip on, on bad days. Some days are good. And those practices include writing actually. And so I'm writing a lot. And when I get a chance, (laughs) it's usually a night after the kids go to sleep, but um, you know, when I have the energy and the chance, I do write. 
a diet of, of uh, limited news is important. Yes. Um, and that's helping for me. And when I go down the hole of thinking this is so huge, it's ironic because, of course, that's, of course, the way students have been telling me they feel about climate change. And, of course, the youth climate movement has been telling us that for some time. And I love that meme that says, hey, boomers, the way you feel about coronavirus is the way we've been feeling about climate change. It's like, yeah, exactly. We, I've been writing and thinking about the scale of big problems that feel out of your control and how to cope with that. And so I kind of realized I had to put my own book into practice. And so I did <laughs> cracked open the book and tried to remind myself what I'd written. Um, and one of the big things that I really hold on to as a strategy is in the, ver the last chapter, the conclusion is feed what you want to grow. And it's of course, one of Adrian Marie Brown's emergent strategy principles. And I found that it extremely important for my mental health on a daily basis is to think about, if not write down lists of what I want to grow. Um, and so instead of feeding my energy and attention on the terrible, terrible things that are happening, which then kind of eats me up a lot inside, I am trying very hard to put my attention on feeding what I want to grow. And in this moment, there are many, many things I'd like to grow. <laughs> to rise up against what we've got going on here, you know? So there's, that's really helpful. That's a little bit like a further step beyond the gratitude practice. Um, gratitude's awesome. And I love it. I think it's super important, but it's a little bit more active to me. You know, it's not just saying I'm grateful for these things. It's saying I'm committing to resourcing those things. I'm committing to fertilizing these things. I'm committing to intentionally putting effort um, behind making those things thrive. And that's a, that feels like something to do, you know, and I think every, all the despair and anguish and right now I'm really going through anticipatory grief. That's my, my mode right now. It's good. I'm, I'm feeling it. And I'm certainly telling my students to be with this because it really is instructive. And these are the, these are the moments that will turn into the light, right? They'll, they'll show us the light. But the solve for me is, okay, yeah, there's that grief. And then there's all this life around me. There's all this life around me. What is that? Let's just feel the hell out of it. You know, it's intense, you know, and, and you guys talk about it in all your work. And, and some of what um, I write about in the book is this, kind of Buddhist recognition of, of our life being transitory. And I really do love what folks have written about once you really come to terms with mortality and death, you can really enjoy life. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I never really fully understood that, even though I had a religious studies degree in college. Yeah. So I think when things feel really big out there, the focusing in on what's re immediately around me is a real strategy for me. And it's a dance all the time. It's like cognitive behavioral therapy or some kind of martial art with your brain where you're constantly guiding your, your mind back to your breath, right? You're constantly mining, bringing your mind, it's a battle all the time to this beautiful thing in front of you right now, you know? Yeah, I just keep thinking, I can't believe we haven't video chatted sooner or met in real life. <laughs> <laughs> why I'm so excited to be with you guys. I'm like, this was destined to happen at some point, you know? I can't believe it. It's just such a joy to have you here that I have about 5 million different thoughts going on right now. I'm not even sure which direction to go in, but I will say that I love Adrienne Marie Brown and her presence throughout your book is amazing. The emergent strategy references, oh, as well as pleasure activism. Her book, Emergent Strategy, and her principles seemed like the solution to the problems I was having with my students. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it started. I thought they all need to read this. So I started assigning the book in my cl classes. And I also tried to implement kind of a strategic questioning and deep listening exercise into my classes, thinking this is pedagogy. This isn't just meetings, you know, this is pedagogy. This, what would it mean to be a facilitator instead of a professor? I've struggled to untrain all the training I have had in my life up to this point to try to really figure out what it means to be a teacher working with students with the principles of emergent strategy. I show them all the time. I have them all everywhere all the time up on the board and, you know, I'm really trying to think about what that means. Her arguments and her ideas that really, they really felt like the answer to the powerlessness stuff. Her argument about critical presence, not, not critical mass just felt so, uh, just felt so great. And her arguments about um, small as all, uh, all that stuff just felt so good and just what I needed. And so it was a medicine for me and I keep trying to give it to my students whether they like it or not. <laughs>
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, Absolutely. I had that experience yeah. with her as well. So I'm really happy mm-hmm. to hear about that. I discovered her in the middle of a depression and just felt like a light inside of me like went off. I just recognized what she was saying was what I needed to hear and what culturally we need to hear right now. And so mm-hmm. I, I'm excited to hear that you're uh, using it well, in your classroom and, and sh- exposing your students to such wisdom. Yeah, she's, she, I, I think and expect the nice thing about teaching that book is first of all, it's very readable. And um, it, it's really, it's a voice countering all of the stuff that our young people have been hearing their whole lives, you know? So uh, it's, it's a radical new way of thinking about what they're doing on this planet. And yeah. um, I never really thought that that was my, my role with teaching. I never thought of myself as doing that kind of work with students. I, never, I always thought environmental studies was really not about any existential, spiritual, psychological stuff. I used to think that was kind of like what people maybe did in MFAs, right? <laughs> or, or maybe, um, maybe um, you know, classes on like critical race theory and stuff where people are really walking through their trauma in a, in an academic setting. I never really thought environmental studies was like that. And then it became like that. (laughs) And, uh, she really helped me figure out how to redirect, re reinvent what I was doing. We talk about this a lot with the good grief network, but we say we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Like we didn't get here alone. You know, what we've done is we've, Uh, borrowed wisdom from a lot of different places and say like all wisdom is shared wisdom, you know, and now in a time of of deep transition and um, uncertainty, it's really important that we can bring our wisdom together and and to find ways to to move forward together. And and I think what you're highlighting about the fact that Adrienne Marie Brown uh, kind of flips the narrative, you know, she offers us a new way to look at things, um, which is entirely refreshing. It's such a gift and it brings me to the title of the book, to your book, so we're transitioning to your book, back to your book, (laughs) A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety. And I like that you remind us that field guides are not all going to tell you everything you want to know. They're kind of like the introduction to give you something concrete, kind of an in to know how to go deeper if you do want to learn about that species, for instance, if you're identifying a particular species with a field guide or something along that line. I'm speaking as an English major and I'm slightly (laughs) insecure that it's showing. (laughs) But I did take biology classes, so I understand field guides. But from a linguistic standpoint, uh, the idea of naming your book like a field guide feels so appropriate and like such a gift. And part of what I love about your book is it's bringing together and weaving together so many things from someone who's clearly an educator and has been doing this for a long time and helping integrate for students. So kind of helping digest a lot of larger material into a way that's accessible for people. And that feels like such a gift. Well, you know, it's an interesting, there was a moment um, where after the 2016 election, when I was under this burnout moment, you know, which is a long, long burnout, it's not over. <laughs> um, I, I still can't figure out how to get out of it. I remember thinking, I was getting sort of angry at my students for asking, it felt to me that they wanted more from me than I could give. They wanted me to reverse the election. They wanted me to get rid of the emissions out of the air. You know what I mean? Like, like looking to me like, how do we solve this problem, Sarah? And I, I didn't know. I mean, I never was, I never was taught and I never dawned on me to teach here's the solution. Now just go do it. I mean, if it was that easy, we'd all have done it. I mean, it sort of drove me crazy that students were so um, sort of frenetic about wanting just the solution. And I felt like I didn't have the skills for this, you know, and I, I had a moment where I was venting about all this with my mom, like, how could I possibly do what they need to have done? I feel resentful. I'm starting to get resentful. And she said, take the skills that you have, and just explain how it's, it's utility in this moment. That's all you have to do. And I thought, oh, God, that's a revelation. Like, okay, I have discourse analysis. I have historical analysis. I have critical race theory. I've got, you know, the stuff you listed in the beginning, Laura. And I thought, I've always thought that they were basically useless. <laughs> Even though, of course, we spend a lot of time trying to promote our usefulness, right? Um, so that we don't get funding cuts and stuff. But uh, in the humanities, we have all these things. And I, I felt like they were, you know, they weren't mm, useful. And I 
was feeling really insecure about that. And her telling me that made me think, oh, I just need to articulate the utility of these things a little bit better for these students. And to me, that also meant when I do a, a discourse analysis of media, it's not just an exercise for a class. It actually has affective outcomes that are maybe implied or implicit that I don't even know I'm asking for my students, which is that when you get a grip on media, when you get a grip on how media works and how it's designed and all the money that goes into manipulating us, you can have control over the emotional effects that that media is supposed to be having on you and not have those emotional effects. And yeah. in fact, you know, actively create other emotional effects based on what you're going to consume, right? And so there's, there's emotional reasons for the kinds of skills I did have. And I just felt like my job was to articulate that. And that was what, that's what the book is. Okay, environmental humanities, what do we do? We bring together lots of different ways of, you know, we bring together sociology, social movement theory, religious studies, whatever it is that we can grab our, our hands on. And the, the difference is it's no longer just for me to write about an innovative idea. Now I feel like the point of all of that is to make students be able to cope with the world and engage it for the long haul. And that seemed to be my mission after, after at that moment. So. Um, a couple more stylistic things that we wanted to bring our listeners attention to is, is something that I really like. Uh, at the end of every chapter, Sarah has included a, uh, like a little a checklist. Checklist. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a gift to people with ADHD. I will tell you that. <laughs> it's awesome. What's really nice too about the, the checklist at the end of the chapter is you summarize what's in the chapter, but you don't do it with your exact words that are in the chapter. You've like given us a, an additional little nugget of wisdom that we didn't already have in the chapter. And for a lot of them, they, they almost seem like they're practices, right? It's like telling us ways to be in this time, in this space. It's hard for me to read books. And uh, as an English major and someone who got an MFA, uh, that's sometimes embarrassing to admit, but it comes down to the fact that I took ADHD meds in grad school and that we don't have health insurance. And so I don't, I can't afford ADHD meds anymore. So I have to meet myself where I am. And so that usually means to read a book, I have to like be on a bike or, you know, doing something active with my body to help me focus enough to read. But I sat on our yard swing and I just read your book like a piece of cake. And so that to me tells, tells me that it's organized well, that it's intuitively structured in a way that just made sense. I don't know, it felt like a gift. And your comment, Amy, about being this being a piece of cake to read is uh, probably the biggest compliment I could get about this book because that was my intention. And I, I'm just blown away by that. And I'm just grateful that you feel that way because that was a profound intention. And the press knew it. The press wanted to do it. We were all on the same page about that. And all of the aspects you mentioned there are in service of that goal. Well, it, it shows and it works well. Thank you. I'm interested in talking about the title uh, and how it applies to events today like coronavirus. Your title says a field guide to climate anxiety. And yet right now, especially for us here at the Good Grief Network, we primarily work with climate anxiety or eco grief or whatever umbrella term we kind of want to call it. But I think that your book has real world applications to what's happening with coronavirus and, and our responses to that. Can you speak to that a little bit? Oh, thank you for asking that, because of course, that's, that sort of goes back to what I was saying earlier about those resilience practices that I was knew I had to build a few years ago, and um, realizing that what my students needed was resilience practices, and that was what I started to need to teach, not just about environmental themes or issues. And the earlier we build, we start building those practices when we have resources, you know, when we have emotional t or time or whatever kinds of resources, the more we can get through stuff like what's happening now. And I think, amazingly enough, the climate generation has been thinking about these resources for some time, and they're pretty well equipped to deal with what's happening right now. Um, precisely because every single thing in this book that applies to climate anxiety applies to coronavirus anxiety. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, it's just, and, and there, there, there are important differences, which I'll, I want to talk about, but some similarities are also pretty key. Um, well, first of all, um, the biggest difference between climate and coronavirus as, as things that are looming out there as risks that we worry about is really, I, I draw on risk theory or risk perception theory in, in conservation psychology. And the fear that we have around the risk of coronavirus is um, in part 
having a lot to do with its immediacy and various aspects of the way this fear presents, this risk presents itself, that is very different than the way climate change presents. So lots of climate psychologists have explained ad nauseum why it is that people don't perceive climate change to be a risk. Well, the main reasons that they don't perceive climate change to be a risk is because they're not feeling it in their bodies and in their daily lives and in their wallets. So you gotta hit them materially with a threat before it becomes perceived as a risk. And climate change is just by its very definition, not going to be perceived like that. It is what Rob Nixon, literary critic Rob Nixon, calls a form of slow violence. He uses the word violence after the word slow precisely to try to bring out the fact that just because something is slow and unfolding doesn't mean it's not an emergency or disaster or crisis or violence for that matter. And so this notion that climate itself is this background, this is, is a background phenomenon whereas weather is an immediate phenomenon that we do experience, that, very, that in and of its own self is a reason why we can't, people have a hard time thinking that climate change is, is a thing to worry about. Yeah. So the newness of coronavirus, the, the various aspects of risk psychology of coronavirus, and the fact that by its, in its in, inherent design, climate change is not something that we're gonna care about as a risk, um, is, are some important distinctions between them. However, the connection between them is far more material than people are really able to quite grasp. And I, on the one hand, I kind of want to just cross out the word climate on the front of the book and put coronavirus and just say, it's the same thing. <laughs> just, just read the same book for the same thing. Um, on the other hand, what's missing in the book, which I didn't anticipate when I wrote it, but is certainly being discussed now, is the fact that of course, climate, one of the ways that we're going to perceive climate change is by the increase of infectious diseases. And yeah. so here we are, we're living climate change, we're just living it in a more immediate way than we had you know, three months ago. Many of us, many of us were experiencing climate change three months ago in other ways, but my, in my cushy little California life, I was not experiencing climate change like that. My students, many of my students from parts of California where they were having fires, extreme fires, and you know, people are experiencing climate change in their immediate lives. That's how you will know that people will start to care about climate change. That's what they can feel it. Yep. And so in some ways, we don't even need to call it climate change. Call it coronavirus. Call it fires. Call it, you know, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, that is, it, it doesn't, it's almost irrelevant whether we call it coronavirus or climate change. <sighs> Same thing. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. The other thing I want to point out that in, in one of the chapters, um, the one about be less right and more in relation, um, in that chapter, um, I draw on a lot of experts thinking here, um, Kari Norgard, uh, Per Espen Stokes, um, a couple of other folks who are talking about, and David Pello, David Pello is an environmental justice uh, scholar at UC Santa Barbara, who are arguing that the way that the ways that we are going to perceive climate change the most and the most quickly and in the ways that help us attend to the questions of social justice around it is going to be through the issues of public health and health. And so if we want to start mobilizing people around, really, you know, politicians who don't care about what's happening after four years can't possibly deal with climate change, which is much larger temporally. Um, the way that we can get people to start to orient, really mobilize resources around and political will around climate change is if we reframe it through the lens of public health. And I think this moment with coronavirus really captures that, right? It's, a, it's proof of that. We are mobilizing resources and we are learning new skills and we're building community and we are doing all of these things. We could certainly do more, but we're doing all of this stuff because of public health. And climate change is number one way that we're going to perceive it is through public health. Yeah, I hear you. Absolutely. You know, you said a second ago, we can take out the term climate, we can put coronavirus in there. It still holds true. And something I want to talk about, because it's very present in our lives here, is uh, the term eco-anxiety, or sometimes we use climate grief. You know, it just seems like eco-anxiety has become a kind of umbrella term that many of us are using to be on the same page about something. And I find that the definitions that have been put forward about eco-anxiety are really limiting. They're really narrow. And uh, your book does a great job of going into a few different terms. If you talk about eco guilt, eco grief, a term you use is existential Anthropocene disorder. And I'm just really curious about where you're coming at this from an English standpoint, linguistic standpoint. Uh, is it helpful to sort of use an umbrella term like eco anxiety or climate anxiety? Do we maybe need a bit more nuance in, in this definition? I'd be interested to just hear your, your read on the current way that we're using these terms. Yeah. Um... 
That's such a great question. And I could go about a million directions with this. I would like to focus in on one that might be most useful to your listeners. The reason, the most important reason why I think we need to have many terms is so that we don't um, elide differences between people's affective or emotional or existential experiences with these problems. And that's important because when I think of anxiety, and I'm not a psychologist, so, you know, speak to the psychologists. <laughs> there are differences between these words. Um, when I think about anxiety, I think about something that's anticipatory, you know, that's something that's thinking about, um, you know, your amygdala is on fire because, you know, something is on the horizon that's scary. And that is not the case for some people who are experiencing climate change and climate trauma right now, right? Or, or yesterday, or in, in, like in their real lives in an immediate way. And so I think the words that we use to describe them need to capture some variety of the human experience and also thereby attending to and naming and, and lifting up the real uneven ways that people are experiencing climate change. Um, some people are experiencing it in really traumatic and um, tragic ways as we speak, and some people haven't, you know, haven't experienced it in any way that they, that they can name it, that they can connect the dots for. And, uh, you know, the, the call for many different words has to do with trying to capture the variety of, of people's experiences with it. Now, is there, is there some merit to having a term that kind of encompasses them? I think that there is merit in saying, hey, there is an increasing need for emotional and existential tools for people to cope with this stuff. And they can all kind of go into one category as quite different from the technological or the political or the discursive or the cultural or the whatever, right? Um, you know, this is where I'm thinking about deep adaptation and Bob Doppelt's transformative resilience and a couple other uh, folks who have basically said, I mean, Joanna Macy, of course, has said this a long time ago, um, that there is a real need to divide between the technological solutions that people are going to be doing kind of external to their, to their interior selves and the work that's happening inside of them. And that, of course, is very inconsistent with the way academia works, the way teaching works, where we expect students to walk into the classroom. And we've been trained as professors, or at least I have, I should speak for myself here, been trained to have this kind of disembodied Cartesian split between my heart and my body are over here. They're not relevant to what's happening in the classroom or what I'm going to do for scholarship or how I'm going to make, a, you know, make it in the world. And then there's the mind, which is so prized, you know. And that's why emotional intelligence as a concept is so subversive, right? Because it's like, oh, you can do both, you need both. Um, and I think that, that bringing the emotional and the existential, you know, the heart um, and the soul back into these, these intellectual conversations is, is where the merit is to say there's, there's a real thing happening here. And we won't be able to do those other solutions if we don't really understand what, what solutions are needed in the interior world. So, so there's a yes and no to your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'd like to read one of your sentences to you because it's amazing and it fits with what you just said. Your existential health is the soil in which the future you desire will germinate as well as the nourishment required to make it a reality. You know, my yeah. feeling about that is that people often think that that could be secondary, that that's for, that's for when you have time after the revolution, and, or like it's somehow a navel-gazing enterprise, or that it's somehow only available to privileged people. And in my research on this, I was very hesitant to even go down this path precisely for that reason. That's, I'm, I have my background as an environmental justice stuff, and I'm not going to go sit here and talk about how we feel, you know. And then... I read Adrian Marie Brown, right? <laughs> and, then I, and then all these things started happening. I started researching this book and I realized, and I had a wonderful conversation with my dear friend, Renee Bird, who's an abolitionist scholar. And she said, oh, she, she of course loves Adrian Marie Brown. We, had a, we actually did a book group together, she and a couple other colleagues and I. And right when it came out, we had this like moment where we had to read this book together and you know, drink Manhattans and figure it out. you know. And she said to me, in reading the misery resistance work and in reading pleasure activism too, as it, as it was mentioned in Emergent Strategy even before the book came out later, um, that the greatest form of resistance that we can have to austerity, to you know urgency being dictated from the top down, to the forms of sacrifice that are being asked uh, that are actually oppression coded in the greater good or whatever, 
um, that 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 maintaining pleasure, maintaining the things that we want to live for, maintaining well-being is the greatest form of resistance, and that to let those things go is um, is uh, is a sign that the oppression is happening, right? Like that's, it's, it's actually working because we've surrendered the protection that we can have around that. And we're not trying to deny that oppression is happening. We're trying to deny that suffering is happening. Um, but the, the very disciplined and, and it's not easy protection of the things that give us pleasure and beauty is, is part of the resistance. And that is an interior exercise. Um, I mean, in community, of course, but interior exercise. And I think that was a real mind-blowing point my friend Renee said to me. And um, I really have held on to it and really shaped the way um, I wrote about burnout in my book. Because I think many people find, and I'm, I'm, I'm really inspired by Marisol Cortez's work on deceleration. And I quote her at length in the book. And I, gave, I saw her give a talk once and I, it, I had to follow up with her and say, you blow my mind. And then I interviewed her with my student, Maddie Whaley for Big Planet, Big Feels. And we did a little podcast and oh my gosh, she had me on the edge of my seat. Um, and her work about the productivist imaginary of even activism is similar to capitalism in that it is designed to burn you out. And I thought, gosh, that's what was happening to my students, right? They, they sort of, it's like a badge of honor that they're miserable and burned out. And because that's a sign that they are caring enough and that they're legit enough, they're woke enough, they're engaged enough, if they're not sleeping and if they're destroying themselves, right? Yeah. It's somehow like this performance of burnout is part of the activism. And it was a real epiphany to me that I was allowed to be joyous even when I was teaching awful things and that that was a, an affect I was putting on as part of my um, desire to impress upon students the importance of this, of this stuff. And I have really let that go. It makes me think of Audre Lorde's quote that we use a lot in Good Grief, and I saw it in your book and got so excited, but she says, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it's self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. Exactly. I used to somehow feel like I didn't deserve to feel it because that quote coming from a queer black woman was absolutely revolutionary. And as a white woman, what does that mean for me? I'd love to speak to that because I, it's easier for me to, to argue for that with, as, as a policy or as a, as a recommendation or as a mantra for my students. Um, I think the vast majority of my students are, you know, we're in a CSU system, they're first generation, we're now a Hispanic serving institution. So I can't assume that my students are in some way so privileged as to not get the social justice and the critical race analysis of that, of that statement of Audre Lorde. They are probably the ones that most need Audre Lorde, Audre Lorde's approach. And so it's, it's super, it's, it feels like the right thing to be doing um, for, for them to lift up a voice like Audre Lorde's and say, there's a long trajectory of coping with suffering and there's a long trajectory similarly of self-preservation um, that goes with that. And that, that legacy is important to lift up, whether or not it's mine or not. Yeah. Well, and, and I would say the world needs Audre Lorde right now. And that is what I love about Adrienne Murray Brown is uh, really kind of translating that voice for us in the younger uh, generation and helping us understand what it meant for Audre Lorde to say something like that and the time she said it and what a revolutionary act that is. And thank God for that, I guess, is all. Yeah, I yeah. And that was the, the studying of social movements that I thought about. You know, I thought the history of people who have really seen bad things happen in, so, in social movements, you know, when we think about the, them across the, the globe, not just in the U.S. The amazing leadership and the amazing ways that those leaders and those movements have um, articulated in their biographies and articulated in their, in their public talks, their, the forms of resilience they've had to have and how important things like pleasure and beauty have been for them. And, and I mean those words in terms of, um, as sort of second words for self-preservation or self-care. I think maybe self-care is maybe not necessarily always the best word for describing what they're talking about, but it does have to do with what the, the inner, inner strength that we have to 
carry on without any evidence that what we're doing is going to do anything for our, the change we want to see when we have so many setbacks when we have you know the notion that we have to have evidence that we're succeeding to keep going would mean that many of us would stop doing anything and so the the form the sort of long trajectory of people those shoulders that you guys talked about standing on when you introduced yourselves to me right that you're standing on shoulders helping students see that they're standing on lots of shoulders of people who have had similar kinds of despair and and um uh moments of apathy and, and hard nights of the soul is is really emboldening for them they're not it's, they're not the first people to to have to figure out where their resolve is going to come from you know yeah thank you for that holding competing truths in the same hand can be hard and it can feel stressful but this tension gives us an opportunity to understand how important our feelings about truth are to our behaviors and commitments this idea of tension giving us an opportunity especially struck me because as a facilitator i trust my body if i get a wave of anxiety in the middle of facilitating it's often a uh, an alert that either something's off something needs to be said to bring the conversation back into balance that tension as an opportunity i'd never quite thought of it in that way before but it then relates to the quote that says remember that the front lines are your very own body We'll also probably see a good grief beam of that because right on uh, the front lines are our own bodies. And I think in activist circles, we've been ignoring our bodies. We've been taught push through, push through. That's what you do. Um, and it's just not sustainable. And so uh, the trusting the body's wisdom, but also the, the gift of tension. I think we're taught to think that tension is bad, but I know as a DJ that tension in music is essential for the tension and the release and uh, for the flow. And so I, I'm just really excited about this idea as tension being an opportunity. And I was curious if you wanted to elaborate on that or just how you came to think of it in that way. Wow, uh, I love what you're saying there. And I think it's um, exciting that you're thinking about it in terms of the body metaphor, because I don't think I really started to be able to do much of this actual work myself until I started doing yoga and that's because I'm a very cerebral person my my mind feels like where everything's happening and I have to use my mind to work out everything so I'm extremely cerebral and it's hard for me to even know what that would feel like to switch gears and go into a different type of intelligence for me but yoga was the way I was able to even access that at all and yoga made me realize that the things that were happening in my body were metaphors for the lessons I needed to learn for myself, for my mind or my soul or whatever. And I just wasn't going to have access to those insights if I wasn't doing the stuff with my body. And that was a mind blowing thing for me, body blowing, whatever you want to call it. Um, there you go. Privileging the mind again, <laughs> um, but <laughs> our language. Um, so that whole thing was new to me when I first did yoga. I mean, I was never, taught that it's not an intelligence that i was ever get taught and it's maybe not even intuitive to me or whatever it doesn't matter but the notion that, that when you're having attention in your body if you think about that you know um that feeling of discomfort when you're trying to do a stretch that you're not capable of doing it the way the yoga teacher does it and you're pushing yourself to try to do that that thing is called tension and that is where the opportunity for your growth is and when students describe the kinds of existential work that it takes to to go through some of the, you know to go through environmental justice work as difficult and and they thought they were getting out of some heart or program like environmental science by coming over to environmental studies where they didn't have to do so much math and science they thought it was going to be easier but it's actually existentially quite more difficult and somehow we accept that the sciences are going to be hard that going to the gym is going to be hard that there are certain things that are built that in order to get better at them, you have to embrace challenge and difficulty, but we somehow don't think that way about emotional work because that's just sort of like not important. Just like Laura was saying, it's sort of not centered as a, as a, as a discipline, as an exercise in, in Western culture. And so that to me is kind of what I'm trying to correct a little bit because it certainly has been a long going painful process for me and a long ongoing painful process for my students, which is where this all comes from, trying to help them chew through what's going on there. But the scaling into the interior world and to the body 
is my main point with that quote about the front lines of your body is that when we start to let aspects of our bodily health go, it is a signal to our hearts and our minds and our souls that we can start to let that go too. That's going to be next, right? And I think that the reminder to yourself that you're worthy of having clean teeth, <laughs> you're worthy of sleeping in a clean bed or whatever it is you whatever is the realm of your control that you can do um, is a reminder that there's a reason for you to be on this planet and that you have a purpose to live there's it's, it has a larger analogy in your in your existence on the planet um, so that's kind of what I'm where I was going with that thank you so much I love that Amy and I have really been talking about in good grief how people have to turn inward and really assess what they're feeling. And as people, both Amy and I have anxiety and depression, and I realized that my anxiety was, was peaking, especially with coronavirus. Uh, and I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to, to deal with it. And then finally, I just said, like, sit with it, feel it, feel what's happening in your body. And just by giving myself permission to attend to it without any words or without any, like minimizing that experience, it actually dissipated the anxiety. And I realized that my previous technique to deal with these really heavy emotions is to kind of ignore them or distract myself or, or pull away from it. And you know what's in, being invited in this time and place, whether it's through your book or Good Grief or Joanna Macy's work is really attending to what's happening in our interior worlds is to pay attention to the the feelings as they come and not minimize them not distract not uh try to do something else instead of paying attention to what what that information is telling us and we've come to the conclusion that emotions are really additional data points that provide information to us and, and previously they've been ignored or perceived as weaknesses but why would we throw out this whole realm of additional data and, and ways of being in the world you know it just seems um it seems crazy now that we we have have created this sort of cartesian dualism that says like my feelings don't matter, only what is produced by my mind, even though feelings are in the body and the mind. Anyway, it's, it, it's insane that, that we've tried to create such division between these two ways of interpreting the world, when in reality, we should bring all these data points together. You know, it really helps in decision making, I think. Absolutely. I, I wrote down the quote, the self-study required to get good at being intentional with our energy takes time and is not a linear process. I wrote it down mostly because I needed that reminder. <laughs> but also what I wanted to hear about was, uh, I imagine you have to communicate that to students a lot or that you encounter students uh, that need to be reminded that self-awareness matters and that it's not going to magically happen overnight. And so I was curious how you, how you handle that dialogue or, or what you would say to a student in that situation. Oh, gosh. Um, well, the, it's a funny thing you bring that up because there's a part of me that feels like um, the, my job, my workload and my job description are out of whack now with what I really want to be spending my time doing, like the stuff that's in this book and talking to you guys, right? Um, the self-study part, the strategies around that, including for myself, right? I feel like I'm just beginning this foray. Um, I really would love to devote myself to that entirely. And I sort of feel like I wish my job description on campus was that that's what all, that's all Sarah does, right? She just does that helping students with self-study while she self-studies and we all just do that together and figure out, share notes and see how that's going, you know? Um, and that's not my job description. So I have to kind of build it into weird places in my syllabi and in the classroom. And it, it feels awkward. It's challenging. Um, and there are some students who really are excited about it and, uh, and some students who feel like that's not what they signed up for and that's not where, where they're at. So, you know, I'd say I navigate it by bringing it in in ways that often feel vulnerable and risky. And for some students that is very exciting and some don't want to be there for that. And that's just sort of frustrating. You know, I can't, I can't, I don't really want to be doing this work with people who don't want to be doing it, you know? So um, unfortunately I'm not in a situation where that's what everybody I work with wants to be doing. So. But you know, that's life. <laughs> so, you work with the people who want to show up and you, you know, you, the rest of it feels like pushing paper and that's fine, you know? 
Well, and this makes me think about how the problems are so big and they're so daunting. And, you know, how, how does one person find their agency? You know, how, how can we make a difference? You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that me as an individual, as one person, I can't save the world. And we come back to in good grief that, that you don't have to, it's not your place to save the world. And your book speaks to this. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit of insight with us. Yeah, I'd say that the number one source of despair for my students, which I consider like a proxy for young people, which the youth climate movements of the last two years have proven to be sort of true. <laughs> so I appreciate all they've taught me. Um, but the number one source of their despair has to do with that problem, Laura. Um, the problem of feeling small and feeling ineffectual in the face of such a large scale problem. And I think that that's a very, there are some very unfortunate ways that the problem has been narrated and described and framed in so much media um, that it's, it's less a matter of the problem's too big and there's just no way you can make a big difference in the problem. That's always been the case for all problems. <laughs> it's like, there's nothing new here. Why does it feel somehow even more like we're powerless in that? And I think that that's because of a bunch of ways, a bunch of bad stuff that we've all been taught and many of us have not been um, critical enough of. And that's where the chapter in there about scaling your action and um, figuring out your, where your power lies has as much to do with criticizing the narratives that tell people they're powerless and rethinking how this has been framed um, so that we feel, we see our power better. It's not that we gain power by anything I say in that chapter, but that we see our power more clearly. That did, kind of gets rid of all of the um, the bad messaging that we have all been swallowing about how individuals have no power, how America is full of all these individualists, how it only matters to do anything if it, you can see it making a difference, that guilt and sacrifice are the most important reasons to be making decisions and the only way to save the planet. I mean, there's all kinds of things, um, the urgency of the situation, the ways that climate rhetoric really is trying to deploy urgency when the climate as a movement, as a problem is, is not an urgent in your face problem. That's the point of it. I mentioned that earlier in this the coronavirus feels urgent, but the, the whole point of climate is it doesn't feel urgent. So to try to force urgency with the apocalyptic rhetoric, it actually has backfired on most young people. And I think um, it makes them feel absolutely depleted that they have nothing to offer, so why should they even try? And that those are really destructive things and those have entirely to do with narratives. They have nothing to do with reality. And I think reframing the narratives and finding ways to see more clearly the power that we do have actually is a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? That, that gets people to feel like, oh, I, I could do something. And all of a sudden they do one little thing and then that little one thing turns into, you know, scales out, this is emergent strategy, right? So. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. I, uh, and there's so many things that I wanna say because I think that what you were saying is exactly what we need to be hearing, right? We need to reframe the crisis and our agency and uh, what we can do. Uh, our step 10 in our program, it used to be take action, but then we thought that was too prescriptive. And we realized that we wanted to be trying to help people discover where their skills meet their experiences and their passion, because we think that that intersection is where power comes from, where one's power comes from. And uh, so now the step is called reinvest into meaningful efforts. And I think that your book does a really good job of saying, like, let's reframe what action even means. And you have a whole list in there. And, you know, people are going to have to buy your book to see that list of what action means. <laughs> but it's really important that we start having conversations that action doesn't have to mean you're on the front lines of an Extinction Rebellion blockade or something like that. It can be. It can mean that. But that's not where action stops. You know, I think I think we need to be more nuanced in in knowing again where maybe our strengths and experiences and passions meet up because that's going to be what sustains us for the long haul. That's going to be where we can show up time and time again. That whole part of like rethinking action came out of my own frustration with my students 
that they didn't like sitting in the classroom talking about this stuff and reading about it. And they wanted to, they felt like their situation was so urgent that they had to get out and do something. And they were very impatient sitting in those desks. And I don't blame them. I mean, I don't blame them, but I really wanted to make thinking a kind, I had to, you know, if action is the, the fetishized thing, um, and Andrew Marie Brown talked about it in her book that this sort of action almost sort of became like sort of there was almost a masculine uh, dimension to it that that felt like um, action was privileged over thought or feeling uh, or discussion or deliberation in a way that in activist circles, it makes it easy to sidestep some of the really good critical thinking that we ought to be doing before we decide what action to take. So I think um, books that tell you actions you can take, which still even when I go around giving this talk about this book, people still ask me, what action should I take? And I think, yeah, I don't think you've been listening to me. <laughs> you know, the, I'm not going to prescribe anything. And it came out of just years of my students asking me just what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? And me just thinking this was just the silliest question in the world. It, it, what you do has to be the end result of all kinds of thinking about what's what is going to be the best d devotion of your energy in your life. And that's going to take some some thinking and some talking with people and some, you know, just jumping into action because you read it in a book just seems like not a way to live a life. Yeah. Well, and dare I say feeling, you know, maybe your action and your place of action might require you to turn inward and, and see <laughs> what you're feeling. Dare you say, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this actually, the conversation we're having makes me think of the Clarissa Pinkola Estes quote where she says, ours is not the task of fixing the entire world all at once, but of stretching out to mend the part of the world that is within our reach. Uh, we use that quote a lot in our program and we just, it's so freeing almost, you know, like I'm a perfectionist, I have depression, I was an environmental studies student uh, and I kept seeing all these problems thrown at me uh, and and again, there was no talk of solutions. And so somehow I put it into my head that I had to be the person to solve all these problems, that it was somehow on my shoulders to figure all of this out. And I think um, the freeing aspect of like just reaching my arms out and affecting the change where I can has been revolutionary in my own life. And that's something that we try to try to teach in our program is, is you're not expected to save the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're just expected to sort of show up and do that interior work we've been talking about. I love it. And I think that's, you know, this is really the biggest insight for myself and for my students. Everything I wrote in that chapter has to do with my experiences with students and realizing how, um, what a waste of all of that potential energy that they, before they even got started, they would feel that there was no point in it. And so they wouldn't keep going. And I thought, well, that's, where is that coming from? We need to tackle that. We need to tackle those messages. That's what that chapter is about. And then we need to give them good arguments for why that still matters to do what they can do. And that's where that, you know, the inspiration for that chapter is all about me trying to puzzle through that issue. Um, I think it's an interesting thing. You know, those, um, those infographics that we're watching right now about how a virus spreads, but through contact, yeah. like the little stars in the constellation and they're bouncing off each other and the thing gets different colors as it, this virus spreads, right? Well, this is so, I mean, what we're being asked in this moment of coronavirus is to imagine the individual as having a huge impact, right? That your individual action of staying home or your individual action of reducing your number of contact is going to exponentially reduce how many people die. That is, that is all I'm suggesting. <laughs> I mean, for some reason, that infographic and coronavirus, people are getting it in that moment, in this moment that like my individual actions within a collective matter. But that infographic could well as be emergent strategy infographic, right? That when you do one tiny thing next to you, it bounces off five the people and then the five more people have five more people and it goes on and on and it goes, you know, and instead of being scary, scary, scary coronavirus, we think, awesome, look at all this positive impact my reaching my arm out had on the world, right? And so to me, um, imagining the power of the individual in a collective, that infographic is very, serves, serves my point really well in this moment, um, except for in a positive way instead of a negative way to show, to show how that works, right? Um, yeah, the, 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 pow the power of the individual is all we have to have. We, we're, we're never more than our individual selves in a collective. 
<laughs> yeah. It, it makes me think of the ripple effect. Like we can't possibly know how much we, impact we've had on another person or on another community. You know, it just, you do the good work because it's the right thing to be doing at the time. And you just know that you're, you're putting good into the world and it's picked up by another person. And then that person's doing good in the world. Yeah. And it's really, it's really a, a, an important point. I, I really learned from reading Rebecca Solnit's work here um, that the you'll never know when the game is done it's you know activism she she talks about activism not being a chess game it's a dive into the dark or something like that and i i love that because so many of my students and people i love think why should i do x y or z if i can't if it's not going to make a difference and i think that's that is that's the wrong question to be asking and that's learned helplessness right like who benefits from that corporations, <laughs> that, yeah. you know, so there's, we have to have a different reason for the reason, the things that we do and it, whether it's emergent strategy or whether for me, it was when I, that moment I described in the book writing, when I read Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer and realized that um, the reason I could do something differently was has nothing to do with the, what, whether or not it would have end results that we could measure about reduced emissions on the planet that felt too big but rather that it had to do with a sacred relationship that I had with something or something next to me. And that to me, practical reverence is what she calls it. That to me, the practical reverence of my daily actions is so much more compelling than feeling like I'm depriving myself or feeling like there's no way that if I don't use a straw, it's going to really make any difference to some turtle, you know, um, that those are, those are the ways that, most advertisements around going green are trying to argue the, the vast majority of sustainability arguments are in that vein. And I just think it's, a, they're missing the mark. It's, it's not the, the guilt is not the most pleasant affective emotion that drives long-term change and behavior change. And you know, the behavioral scientists and the behavioral psychologists know this. So I don't understand why their knowledge isn't being used better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, and it makes me think, uh, I worked in marketing very briefly. Uh, it did not go well, <laughs> as you can probably imagine with my background. Um, <laughs> but I remember reading an article about the power of guilt to manipulate people to buy things. Yes, yes. So for me, I'm like, of course, of course, that's the emotion that uh, because you can't alleviate it. like guilt guilt does not you know you don't satisfy guilt so you can keep buying and buying and buying and buying <laughs> right right yeah. so a lot of our conversation is making me think about uh something else that you had written about basically our ability to imagine and our ability to really believe in things and and believe in solutions and i'm gonna i'm gonna put the word solutions in quotes but you know it's it's sort of like uh if we believe we can't contribute to climate solutions than we can't and that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy but in addition to that you hit the nail on the head uh, because you started talking about this idea that humans are bad for nature and and not only are we seeing that in the climate realm and eco side but we're seeing it now with the coronavirus you know that and we're seeing it really strong coming out like well humans are the real virus and you know we're being cleaned up and and you you're really strong in saying like, well, if we believe that, does that not become a self-fulfilling prophecy? And so, you know, if you have a moment to talk about this, uh, this idea that humans are not a virus and that, you know, specific races are not to blame for what's happening right now in this current pandemic and with climate change. Yeah, there's so many things in that. And I feel really strongly about this question. So thanks for asking it. Um, so, one of the things that of course the environmental movement has done to young people i don't think it meant to but it's the message they got you described laura being an environmental studies student and receiving these messages and they actually made you feel powerless right yeah. of course that wasn't the intended pedagogy the intended pedagogy was to make you wake up to the problems and thereby thereby go fix them and of course the intended pedagogy around um much of what the environmental movement has been doing with young people has been to make them feel like their existence on the planet is bad and there's a lot of it is in the argument that all of humanity has done this awful stuff to nature we see it in disney movies we see it in all kinds of representations um and you know young people start to realize that their very existence you know they should be leaving no impact and of course there's that awful church of euthanasia quote that i recite in my book which is you know you see it in bumper stickers and stuff save the planet kill yourself 
And I think that the, whether or not we are actually, you know, environmentalists are actually telling people to do that, a, a lot of people are. And, um, and certainly young people are receiving that message. So the leave no trace, leave no impact kind of mantras of environmentalism have, have kind of take, gone off to the, um, to the worst logical conclusion so that you actually have people who are um, sort of erasing themselves before they even get started. And that's what I see a lot in my students thinking that they only have had negative impact on the planet and that's all they can think about. They can't think about what positive they could possibly add because they've only got, they're bad. And so I think the first step that has to happen is to, you know, undo that, undo that, the notion that your impact, impact in, in by its very definition is a bad thing, but that impact can be a good thing. And also this takes some lessons in history if we're not, our, if, you know, as a person who's from a settler colonial background myself, um, it's, you know, hard for me to look to anything that my people have done and say that that stuff has been good. But uh, there's a lot of communities, of course, that have been living in different relationships with nature that we can't possibly clump all of humanity into a category called bad and nature good. And certainly, you know, um, when we clump everybody in that same category, we're erasing all those differences and we're making it super easy for more conservative agendas um, like, for example, the kind of rise of ecofascism again in the U.S. right now um, to take up environmental arguments for their beliefs and to sort of hide their more um, xenophobic and, and violent values and um, treatment of people of color in behind a kind of a more acceptable or palatable green greenwash. And I think um, the danger of environmental arguments against humanity is that they can be used to target particular communities. And that's certainly happening right now with the coronavirus. And um, you know, this is something that has a long trope in environmental discourse. This is not the first time we've seen environmentalists and people who are really xenophobic who then take up environmental arguments to defend their, their corner. Uh, we've seen this for a long time, even this, in the Sierra Club in the 70s, went through a long period of being very anti-immigrant. So the zero population growth, kind of neo-Malthusian lifeboat ethics approach to environmentalism, which is that there are only so many resources on, in this country and we need to preserve them just for ourselves, involves having to decide who ourselves are and who is not. And, and that's really what we see happening with putting up walls instead of trying to provide resources around coronavirus. It's manifesting in all kinds of forms of violence, uh, physical and otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for that. So yeah, it starts with people realizing, young people realizing they're, they're not bad for the planet. And hey, look, lots of people in lots of societies are also good for the planet. And hey, also look at when I say, when I say that over and over again, it gets taken up for really bad for bad purposes. It can, the logical extension of humans are bad for the environment um, is borne out unevenly and it's very um, dangerous to people. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, and I, I am thinking, I just keep, I'm stuck on, on this idea that who benefits, you said who benefits from learned helplessness corporations. And this idea, if humans are bad, it, it kind of takes away the accountability of actually doing something to change that narrative, it feels like a narrative that's been written and that's bigger than us. And it makes me think of your chapter, Hack the Story, what happens when we start reframing these stories and, and questioning who told them and why and what was their agenda. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and not to not to uh, segue into the ecological other, my previous book from 2013. But, um, you know, if, if you aren't seeing a lot of stories about how um, lots of people are doing environmental behaviors in lots of different culturally diverse ways and you're only seeing environmentalism framed in one particular way and that way is anti-humanity blah 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 right then you will you will therefore think that some people are therefore kind of not as good for the environment and that if we're going to protect the environment we also have to maybe like exclude those other people from this currently healthy but endangered environment and I think that's how, that's exactly how, um, that's what, that's really what the frontier thesis was in early, in early days of Amer the American story, right? So this notion that um, nature or space or resources, however you want to frame it, is a, a limited resource and that it has to be preserved for a particular group of people so that they can maintain their way of life 
is a recipe for all kinds of awful things. And that's really what's driving like the El Paso shootings and the re res resurgence of ecofascism in the US um, where the white supremacy has been sort of considered in politically incorrect for a while now, but as a form of climate advocacy, it sure does seem a little bit more tempting, you know, and that's really dangerous. Yeah. 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 Whew. <laughs> you know, the questions I keep coming back to in, in my life at this point in time is the question Amy brought up a second ago that you brought up earlier in the conversation is who stands to benefit from the way things are? Who has been benefiting from the way things have been in place? And I think until I started asking those questions myself that I didn't quite understand how deep the systems are uh, and have tendency towards a sort of white patriarchy. Uh, and, and it's just been within the last decade of my life that I've really been asking those questions, you know, e even in our history books. And I think one of my first introductions to understanding this was that who wrote our history books? They were written by humans. You weren't just sort of gifted a history book from God that legitimately told you how history played out. Like somebody wrote that, somebody captured that story. And usually it was, it was through a particular lens of probably a white male. Um, and I, I guess that for me, I mean, I grew up in rural Michigan, and so it's interesting to, to have gone to college and then grad school and to be having conversations all over the world and realize that much of what we understand is through a certain frame and that sometimes we have to remove that frame to be able to see things a little bit differently. But first, you have to know that a frame exists before you can even want to remove that frame. And that's been a really powerful lesson for me. Mm, yeah. yeah. And I think that's where I really think this is where um, cultural and literary critics have a have a real skill to offer. You know, um, we're not just studying arcane Shakespeare, not to dismiss Shakespeare, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we're not just reading Beowulf or something, um, you know, for its literary form or something. But that the skills of being able to recognize how frames are constructed and what it reveals about the historical moment and the agendas and the interests and who's excluded, who's included, that's 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 critical thinking stuff from from you know um, rhetorical analysis. And that's just the you know 101. Um, so but what often ha doesn't happen in college is then turning around and saying, and here's how it's gonna make you feel empowered to get up in the morning, you know? Yeah. 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 Those are the types of questions I'm interested in now. I mean, what keeps us going? How do we build uh, resilience in ourselves? Which goes back to another thing you've written because mm -hmm. your book is amazing. <laughs> you end it with this idea that we almost need more than resilience. Personal resilience isn't enough. Resilience needs to be bound up with resistance and that's what's needed right now. I think being able to withstand bad times so that you can come out the other side intact is wonderful, but that's still within an individualist frame and it doesn't quite recognize, although we're starting to, I think the beauty of what's happening now, I don't want to suggest coronavirus is beautiful, but um, many people are starting to write about what it's making society do to rethink structures and systems and it is and one of the one of the outcomes is that people are starting to realize how interconnected they are with community that's what i mean by resilience is bound up in resistance i mean the the, the point of being resilient so you can keep doing the work and it's not to just survive you know? we've talked a lot uh, today about really heavy things and about our interiority and and what it means to be alive in this time and place and we've talked about lenses and framing and wondering Sarah if you'll read a part of your book carry us out with with what we can do in these times what we can do almost every day as a practice to maintain our aliveness and to be present in in this world that's often very painful find beauty savor the small gifts of being alive See everything you possibly can through the lens of being blessed rather than victimized. Recalibrate your efforts towards the small and local. Collect and create positive stories. Heed your calling by not trying to be more than you are. Take yourself less seriously and pause to inhale deeply and honor the moment. This is what it means to learn how to die in the Anthropocene. It's a Buddhist or existentialist goal that means sustaining your will to live so that you can keep trying to stave off the end of the world. 
Thank you, Sarah. Beautiful words. Thank you so much. I'm just very grateful that this spoke to you and had some use for you. And that that's my only hope that it sure will. And it comes from a, a real authentic place. And so it's a little bit vulnerable book for me to put out there. Um, it won't work for everybody, but I sure hope it does work for some. So I it is an absolute gift and it feels like a needed gift right now so it is an honor to have you on the podcast <laughs> absolutely I, the honor is all mine i assure you thank you to sarah jaquette ray for being a participant on our podcast today as we speak about her new book a field guide to climate anxiety we highly recommend that you check out this book and read through it you'll glean a lot of insights from it i'd also like to personally thank a few of our patrons Adair Kovac, Andrea Taylor, Diana Vanderdoes, Jay Hormel, Patrick Gagnon, and the Story family for supporting our work and making sure that we can pay our bills every month. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Why, a Good Grief Network podcast with Amy Lewis Rowe and Laura Schmidt. Thank you to all of our patrons who donate money every month so that we can continue to build the Good Grief Network. If you're interested in becoming a patron or donor, please visit our website at goodgriefnetwork.org.